specific. I think that there are a number of uh, opportunities that cities are realizing um, through some blighted lands that they can, can take advantage of. Um, go first with this. <laughs> Um, so a few housekeeping things uh, for the webinar participants, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, there's a little chat window on your screen, use that and Catherine will um, be your voice in the room uh, for any questions that you might have. Um, past workshop materials you can find, maybe you can't see that super well, next time I will make the font bigger. Um, sorry. And so you can see past workshops from this year and last year uh, related to a number of best practice actions for Green Step Cities. And then if you're on Twitter, the hashtag is Green Step Workshop, W-K-S-H-P. Uh, and then I want to thank Tease Coffee as our official coffee sponsor. Um, and they provide the coffee for each of our workshops. They happen to be in the same building as Great Plains Institute, so it works out really nice. Karen and Minnesota. Um, and so I won't get into this too much, but this um, Twitter lineup, <laughs> <hashtag, laughs> <you guys are. laughs> um, So best practice 25 is green business development, and that is kind of a broad category of, of um, different actions that cities can take under that umbrella. And today we're going to get into lowering the environmental footprint of the brownfield um, through remediation and development. Um, so this can be any number of projects. Uh, for instance, the city of Hutchinson uh, took their closed landfill and put a balanced solar system on it, which is now providing, I think, about a quarter of the energy of their wastewater treatment facility that is adjacent to the site. And so that's just one opportunity where you can sort of turn wasted land into something that uh, is a benefit to the city. And I'm going to list just get into it, and uh, Natalie, are you up first? Okay. Natalie Brown from Minnesota Brownfields. I always see your name and think it's so appropriate. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. So, like Abby said, my name is Natalie with Minnesota Brownfields, um, and I was just recently reading about speech writing, and the topic turned to attention spans of people in the U.S. <laughs> and the attention span of the average person in the U.S. is eight seconds, which is insane. I guess the average attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. <laughs> so let that sink in a little bit. That's kind of weird. <laughs> so it's eight seconds before you start daydreaming about your burrito you're going to have for lunch or before you need to take on your phone and stare at it for a while randomly. Um, so if that's true, that means that you all stopped listening like forever ago, so I can just talk about whatever. <laughs> but luckily for you all, um, I love talking about brownfields. So Minnesota Brownfields, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We promote brownfield cleanup and redevelopment throughout the state um, through education, research, and partnerships. So we do a lot of workshops, we do a lot of forums, we do a lot of trainings. And I'm going to talk specifically about a technical assistance to brownfield program that we have a little bit later on um, for cities in greater Minnesota. Um, but we kind of cover mostly what to do to clean up brownfields in your community and in your city. Um, we have a website also, which is exciting, um, mnbrownfields.org. You can sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive upcoming events, you'll receive notices. Um, about different forums and opportunities, but I specifically want to call out our Land Recycling 101 tab. So if you're a brownfield in your community and you don't know at all how to tackle it, you don't really know where to start, um, start at Land Recycling 101. We have a directory of service providers, we have brownfield definitions, we have research on the benefits of brownfield redevelopment um, in Minnesota under that tab, and also important contact information for different people who can help you um, get your brownfield redeveloped in your community. So I keep saying brownfield. Raise your hand if you know what a brownfield is and if you could maybe define it. Shauna's cheating. <laughs> Anybody? Okay, sort of, maybe not. <laughs> so I wouldn't call on you, don't worry. Um, a brownfield is real property. This is defined by the EPA. Um, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse of which may be complicated by presence or perceived presence of contamination, so hazardous substance or pollutants. 
So a typical brownfield isn't always a steaming green sludge that's really scary. It could look like this. This is also in Hutchinson, it's a former rail depot. Um, they redeveloped this into a community asset. They now have their farmer's market there and weddings there um, in the after photo because I had posted that. I think every community in Minnesota has an abandoned gas station. Usually a brownfield site, they tend to lay vacant for a long time. A lot of times they're in the city center or a really prominent area, um, but a lot of times there's a leaking gas tank that prevents the redevelopment of those sites. So raise your hand if you think this is a brownfield. None of this. <laughs> in the back. <laughs> um, you want to tell me why you think this might be a brownfield? Oh, the rubble, I guess. There's rubble, right. A lot of times, just because you don't know the site history, it looks like the surrounding property is dilapidated and blighted as well. It's vacant. Um, who knows? I mean, there's some plants growing on it, but that doesn't mean it's not contaminated. So just to highlight part of the definition, um, it is often the perception of contamination that leaves the site vacant and blighted for a long time and not the actual contamination. So it could be, like we saw in this picture, that surrounding blight that prevents redevelopment. Or it could be that you just don't know what the site history is so that prevents the redevelopment of that site. It also could be that there's just not a hot market in the area of that site for the redevelopment of that sort of situation. So we all have brownfields in our communities. It's okay, I've thought about writing a children's book called Everyone Has Brownfields. I don't think it would catch on. <laughs> you never know, so the illustrations are important. Um, so as you can see, they're mostly concentrated in the metro. Um, this is taken from what's in my neighborhood that I'm going to talk about. It's an MPCA and Department of Agriculture um, program. The green or the blue dots are the MPCA data, and the red dots are um, Department of Agriculture data. So um, you might think that they are a metro issue, but as you can see, they are all over the state. This is a very, very simplified steps to redevelopment process. So in order to efficiently clean up your brownfields, you really want to set your redevelopment goals before you get started and set them far in advance. Um, then you want to investigate the site. So do your phase one and phase two, and I'll talk about what that is in a second. Um, do your environmental due diligence clean up based on what you find in your investigations, and then you redevelop. So there are no shortcuts in brownfield redevelopment, just as there are no shortcuts in most things in life. Um, be proactive. That is super important um, when it comes to brownfields. Definitely do your advanced planning, do your investigation before you start to develop the site so that you don't get caught with contamination that you didn't know was there. Um, and plan in advance, six to 12 months in advance, so that you can take advantage of funding. You can take advantage of different state and local resources for your redevelopment. So step number one, like I said, identify brownfields. So we are here, those of us in the room, webinar you are not, <laughs> at this location. Um, so this is taken from MPCA What's in My Neighborhood. And if you just Google that, you will find this website, this is a little screenshot. You can look at any space in Minnesota and see um, what sort of sites have permits, what's going on there. They also have like stormwater and other different permits. It's not just um, brownfield potential contamination. Um, so it's a good way to find concentrations of potential brownfields in your community and kind of see what's been going on there, see what sort of prior investigation has happened at different sites. This is a pretty cool tool developed by the Delta Institute out of Chicago. Um, it is a um, brownfield prioritization tool. So if you have an obvious, like maybe five target brownfields in your community, but you don't really know which ones to target and prioritize or which ones might be the easiest, I'd recommend checking out this tool. It's a series of, I think about 50 questions that ask um, who is the owner of the site, do you know what the surrounding property is, that kind of thing to see um, which ones are easier to develop compared to other sites. It's fairly new, I'm not sure how you it's been, but definitely try it out if you um, are looking to prioritize different redevelopment areas. So step number two in the development process is set your redevelopment goals. So this is a map actually of City of Duluth. They received an EPA area-wide planning grant um, to target different brownfield sites in their community for redevelopment and then do some community planning around them. 
you do not need to receive an area-wide planning grant to do um, basic steps of this work. So they targeted five different locations, as you can maybe kind of blurrily see in this map, um, and they're doing some community planning around those areas based on uh, what the community's needs are. This is a fairly high poverty, um, neglected area, so the community is really interested in getting these sites redeveloped um, and changing you know, the face and the perception of their neighborhood. So Minnesota Brownfields, we've been working with the Department of Health to develop a brownfield and health planning tool. And this will be on our website shortly. It's still kind of in the works. Um, we will be at many conferences near you <laughs> presenting about this shortly. Um, but it is a series of six different categories that a community can use to um, consider health aspects when it comes to brownfield redevelopment. And the categories, let's see, we have a few, are context and connectivity, community institutions, economic stability, environmental resilience, health and safety, and social cohesion and engagement. So based on what your community is looking for in terms of brownfield redevelopment, you can really customize this tool and build it into a survey or use it pretty much how you want. We're actually piloting it this in Duluth with um, this project. So once those results are available, we will post them on our website and also have them in our newsletter. So again, basics of the cleanup process. When it comes to brownfields, you don't need to be the expert, um, but you do need to know who the experts are. And we have some of them in the room with Shauna and Chris Nosteed and Janice, who's now an experienced brownfield professional. Um, so you might need to know your local economic development authority or your local planning agency. Um, engineering and consulting firms are important. So steps of the investigate process. Number one, a phase one site assessment is the first thing you will do when it comes to looking up site history. So phase one ends up being a very lengthy report at times that looks back at the past use of sites and the history of what was there before. So it might just be a vacant downtown property, but who knows, there could have been a gas station there, there could be underground bearing storage tanks. You don't know until you do this phase one site assessment what was there. I think Charlie is pretty experienced in phase one. So phase two is what happens after the phase one, of course. Um, but this will be the actual physical testing of soil. So based on what's found in the phase one, um, a consulting um, environmental consultants will go and actually test physical spots in the soil to see where maybe hotbeds of contamination are or to see if there is actually buried underground um, contamination on the site. And from there, they will develop a plan for cleanup and to see what needs to be done and what can be um, redeveloped on the site. And in terms of cleanup, it really depends what was there and what you eventually want to construct on the site. This is taken. Um, at the new Surly Brewery, they found some enormous storage tanks. Very, um, this is fairly uncommon, but it does happen. <laughs> this is a vapor um, barrier system, so vapor intrusion has become kind of a hot topic in brownfield redevelopment lately. We're actually doing a forum tomorrow on vapor intrusion and how to um, prevent vapors from migrating offsite and entering into different buildings. And then ultimately you can redevelop into a whole array of things. We've seen a lot of breweries up in the top. There's Canal Park Brewery in Duluth. Um, many of the breweries in Minneapolis, St. Paul were former Brownfields, which I always tell my friends when I go there with them. This is a Brownfield. <laughs> I'm really fun. <laughs> really great. Um, this one is a chiropractor in the city of Boston. This is um, an affordable housing and child care unit in the city of Duluth. And then this is um, affordable housing and hitting as well. So you can read it all based on um, what you cleaned up on the site. And then finding funding. Kristen's going to talk about funding in Minnesota, but we have a tool on our Minnesota Brownfields webpage under Land Recycling 101 um, where you can enter a bunch of different filters based on the site and then find what sort of funding is available for you. So answering questions like property ownership, location, um, how much money you think you need to redevelop, and then <laughs> it'll spit out all these answers for you. And so I said earlier that I would talk a little bit about our technical assistance to Brownfield. So we partner with the Kansas State University, and they are the Environmental Protection Agency 
have technical assistance to Brownfield's provider for our region. So in the summer, we do a few workshops in greater Minnesota cities. So if you have a specific Brownfield problem, or if you have questions about funding or writing EPA grants, please talk to us. We um, like to do these workshops in communities where they really want them and need them. They're free. You don't need to apply, but we will go and offer um, specific training for you based on what your community needs. So if anyone has any questions, I think we'll hold them to the end. No, we can or we can do them now. Can you just repeat where you found that prior to prioritization tool? Delta Institute. Delta Institute. Yep. Okay. Are there any communities that have Brownfield that they are going to do something? We have one at Fairville World uh, dump site and a public works facility was on it. And then we've got a council that would like to put a park in there. Okay. What stage are you at? Uh, we've probably done one and two, but it's a little bit testing, so we know it's down there. <laughs> Usually not. And it's adjacent <laughs> to a river. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ashana, is that it? Thank you. Is the clicker? So welcome, I'm Shauna Smith, I'm with the Pollution Control Agency, so I work in our Brownfield program, which is housed in our remediation division, so we do cleanup. And a subset of us work on Brownfield sites, and um, there are about 12 of us that do it all day, every day. So. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. If I don't know the answer, I know everyone in the program. We all sit next to each other, so it's really easy to ask questions. Um, and I can find the answer. I've been doing it, I uh, just hit my 10 year anniversary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so I like to throw in a couple pictures. So, Natalie kind of, you know, uh, told you what a brown field is. So, yes, sometimes they look nasty, like this one. Uh, from St. Paul's an old looking hiring company. Um, but yeah, a lot of them are just an old building. You know, don't you don't know what's there and that's why it's a ground field because you don't know yet. So the second half of my presentation talks a little bit about um, a funding opportunity we have at the PCA um, that I think um, some people know about but maybe some cities don't know. So we'll go through that. But the first part of the talk, I just want to tell you about what the PCA does because if you end up having a brown build, you'll end up talking to one of us and, um, to work with you on the site to make sure everything is done uh, to be safe for human health and stuff. So what I'll talk about are the NPCA brownfield programs. Now, the Department of Agriculture has a brownfield program too. It's just not as common. So I don't want to speak on their behalf. I'm going to talk about the ones at PCA. And there's um, the Voluntary Investigation and Cleanup Program and the Petroleum Brownfield Program. And we just really collectively call ourselves the Brownfield Program. Lots of people know the VIC and PDC acronyms, but we're, we're really doing the same thing. So although we're governed by two different statutes, um, uh, we work together. So we try not to do so we are on the same floor, we all talk to each other, and it works out really well. I've listed the statutes. If you're interested, you can look at the slides later. Um, but basically, there's petroleum contamination, and then there's non-petroleum contamination, and there are reasons behind that. But um, uh, I deal with a lot of the non-petroleum contamination, things like your dumps and your old railroads, and your old dry cleaners, and stuff. So these brownfield programs at the PCA where I work, they're created um, to provide technical guidance of working your way through redeveloping them. They're, they're starting to provide uh, legal assurances 
So when you enter our program, you'll, you're usually looking for like a letter that says you're not liable for the site. So even though you're taking ownership and you're going to do the cleanup if it's needed, you're not the one who caused the contamination. So you're not ever going to be um, sued for, you know, recovering of more money for any reason. So that's a big reason why we were created. Um, when people enter the Brownfield programs, they're they're coming in because they they're usually coming in because they know they have contamination, so they've done that phase one environmental science assessment, and they're coming in to go through the next step. So a lot of the voluntary parties that we deal with are um, developers, local units of government, uh, nonprofit groups, sometimes lenders themselves come in with a property. Um, lots of business owners, but really it can, it can be anyone. Um, so I talked a little bit about what we do, but you know these technical oversight aspects and the um, liability assurances. I always remind people we actually charge for our time. So um, a, uh, uh, you know, no one wants to pay, right? But we actually lowered our uh, hourly rate about four years ago from $150 an hour to $125 an hour. So that kind of helps out. And we try to make sure we only have the minimum number of people working on the site. So instead of having two full site team people working on a, a property, now we have one and we just talk to each other more for our checking out. Um, but uh, the biggest part of our program really is finding out what you have at, at a brownfield site because usually it's just unknown. So I'll reiterate the phase one environmental site assessment. And like Natalie said, it's a, it's a history. And it can be a big report, but it's a lot of appendices that you don't necessarily have to go through because that's what your consultant does. So the, the text of the report is usually a bit shorter. You know, I mean, that thick, it's okay, um, with uh, lots of good information. So it, it tells you about, uh, it looks through old maps, old aerial photos, old city directories, anything um, that can help them find out what the site was used for. Interviews, if they're possible, they talk to people, they'll call the fire department, see if there's been hazardous waste stored there, stuff like that. So it's really good. <coughs> So, uh, they're usually a couple thousand dollars. Uh, there are some uh, grants that can help pay for some of these. If people are interested. Um, so what you find out in your phase one generally tells you if you need to do some soil sampling, some groundwater sampling, and maybe soil vapor sampling. Um, and you do that work, like the GeoPro picture Natalie showed, and you take those samples and you figure out if Cleanups even required at your site. So that's uh, where we uh, do a lot of our work, reviewing those data sets, and, and people come up with their redevelopment plans. They talk to their consultants, and they come up with a cleanup plan. And uh, and then we, in the, in the whole process beginning, we issue no association determinations, and at the end go down the list and we issue things like no further action determinations and um, uh, the leak site file closure letters and things that have a long name, but they basically mean that you're, you're done, you did your job, everything's good now. Um, uh, I'd like to point out that, um, you know, we're talking about brownfields, but everyone knows about the remains super fun and so it's like a the known contaminated site, but uh, they're all redeveloped too. They're all redevelopable. Uh, no site's so bad that you can't do anything with it. Um, so we have some examples of some super fun sites that we work with through the Brownfield program um, and redeveloped. So lots of you recognize some of these names. Uh, a lot of these are actually in the Twin Cities, but there are a couple in Duluth as well. Inner Lake site in Duluth, <coughs> sort of in the area Nally was talking about, uh, West Duluth, big industrial hub. Uh, the Heat Gap 
army ammunition plant in Arden Hills, Navy ammunition plant in Grizzly. Um, uh, lots of people know about the National Lead and Riley Tar sites in St. Louis Tar Hill. They're all redeveloped. So now I'll transition into the money, right? Because that's the great part. So the PCA has some funding, um, not as much as um, other big state programs like these that Kristen will talk about. But we have a small subset of money called the Minnesota Targeted Brownfields Assessment Program. Um, it's a grant. Uh, it's a rolling basis. We get new money every October 1st. It's a subset of our money that we get from EPA from the Region 5. And we use it to do assessments on sites where people don't know what's going on. We try to focus on greater Minnesota, but we'll take anyone that comes in um, because we, we just barely get enough people coming in every year to use these funds. Um, uh, so what we do is uh, it's a like a three or four page application. It's all a yes no kind of things, and then filling in some basic site information. There's no essays, it's a rolling basis. You can call up and ask us if there's money first. And and what we do is we use our some of our um, state contractors, state environmental service contractors, and um, and we do the phase one ESA. We do the phase two investigation beneath the ground. We can do some hazardous um, building testing, uh, so like for lead-based paint, asbestos, uh, things like that. Uh, so you can demolish the building or you can have the building. Um, and then we can have them pre the consultants prepare a response action plan, the cleanup plan. We can't pay for the cleanup work. All our work is the assessment part. But we can get you to the point where you know what you have. And if you have something that needs to be dealt with, we can <coughs> pay for the plan so at least you know what it's going to entail and maybe a good idea of what it's going to cost and then you can look at some of these other state and federal resources for, you know. So, a lot more talking than what's actually on the slide, but the basic, um, there's only one kind of site you can't fund and that's a, uh, an active super fund site. Uh, otherwise, we've done it and we've done old school buildings, we've done Park trails, we've done um, sediment sampling up in two harbors. Um, all over the state, we've done a lot of work. Old gas stations, for sure, old dry cleaners, old dumps, you name it, part of those package. So if you end up using this fund or uh, calling me or John, the guy who administers the, the grant, um, in the end, you want to know what you get. Well, you get copies of all the reports, so you don't have to do any of the contracting. We do that. Um, you just um, coordinate getting into building or site access, and and then we do the work, and then you get the reports. It's all nice paper copy, an electronic copy, everything you need to go on. And the biggest thing is you now know what you have, right? So. All these brownfield sites and people are kind of leery and they don't know what they are, where are those weird foundations that are still there, what kind of practices went on, um, and then you'll know. You'll know what you have, you'll know what you're dealing with. Kristen will talk about some funding. Uh, Natalie mentioned the funding tool on the Minnesota Brownfield website uh, where you just do some clicks of basic site information. It'll pop out and tell you what you might be eligible for. It's a great tool because there are a lot of funds that maybe have little quirks and you don't have to learn about those. You just have to get your list and go from there and start calling people. Um, applying, like I said, is, is easy and short. Um, I've put a, a link to the application on the next slide. Uh, but if you have any questions about it, you can always call me or email me. My contact information will be up here. Uh, cities, nonprofits, uh, developers can apply with a city uh, support. Um, so, like we have some uh, developers in the city of Duluth that wanted to use this program. Well, the city of Duluth applied on their path and went through the steps. And 
you can work it out if you have some, some local nonprofit or city or county that's really good. Yeah. Um, so the the official application doesn't really look like an application, but it goes into job venture. It's that yes, no three page thing, then we ask for like a letter of support from whoever's applying, like the city of Duluth or the or the uh, Anoka County. They, they write a one page letter which we give the template for saying that yes, yes, we know what's going on and we're happy to help. That sort of thing. Um, that's it. I said rolling applications, they happen all the time. New money every October. And these are the links. Uh, if you you don't have to look at them before you apply. All, the only one you need to really pay attention to is where we have the application materials. But if you're curious about well, some MPCA Brownfield guidance, there's some links to other stuff. Um, so it's the second. Oh, no. Oh. I thought that was a pointer. Anyway, it's the second line is the link to the application. And then if you can't find that or if our link disappears, they redesign the web page or something odd like that, you can always um, contact us. I'll take some questions if you have them. A lot of information. What is sort of the line between getting Well, oh, it's clear because it's all the same type of contamination. Mm -hmm. But Superfund sites usually get designated a Superfund site because one, they already know there's contamination, and it's usually because there's a, a lot of it, or it, it, it exceeds a contaminant concentration that's a hazardous level. Right? So you might have PCBs, which aren't a real big deal, but if you have a really high concentration, that might have triggered it. But um, a lot of the super fun sites in the state uh, get designated that way uh, because there's no responsible party anymore. There's no one responsible for doing the cleanup. So we have to list it so we can use our money to clean it up. So that's usually how it happens. There are always exceptions. There are super fun sites out there with responsible parties that are doing the right thing and cleaning it up. Um, and a lot of them entered the, the program in the 80s and 90s, uh, you know, big, big sites. And they just did that so they would be working through the process. Uh, Brownfields didn't come into existence until later. It's kind of a shortcut to the Superfund process. In Minnesota, the Brownfield <coughs> program started in um, about 1998. We're one of the first ones. But it's a good alternative. So there's, I would say that all super fun sites are horrible and way more contaminated than brownfield sites. They just came in a different way. And it, it's a lot easier and nicer to go through brownfield because it's faster and it doesn't have that stigma of super fun. <laughs> What has been your favorite or most, or most challenging site that you've worked with? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the day. I was telling Natalie, right now I've been doing a lot of work on the uh, Fridley ammunition plant, the Navy, uh, what they call the NIROP site, the Naval Industrial Reserve Ordnance Plant, blah, blah, blah. It's on East River Road. So it's a, it's a super fun site, but I got pulled in because of the brownfield site as well, and it's um, it's been taking up a lot of my time lately. So I guess that's my favorite right now. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the day you or the week you call, but that's been. What do you just my favorite? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> what I've been working on the most. <laughs> yeah. Um, the breweries are always fun, but I don't like beer. So it's kind of like, oh, I don't really care. <laughs> but usually the people are really nice to work with. Maybe you do all the balls, marking, and for breweries, or is it every brewery? 
separate. Yeah. Uh, every, they're separate. Yeah. If there's just seems to be a concentration of them in yeah. 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 But the one I like, of course, because I don't like beer, is I like sociable cider blend. I like the cider. <laughs> Are there any example from a city that did something particularly creative and challenging? Yeah, we have a couple, and Natalie has mentioned a few, and I can talk about some of our examples. But um, the city of Hutchinson and the, the city of Mankato have done some really nice things. So Hutchinson um, took their old train depot, you saw the railroad tracks kind of lying in the long grass. Um, they, they still have the old historic depot. So we did a bunch of investigation on that block. It was almost an entire city block. And um, and we came up with a cleanup plan. And there was like an adjacent uh, uh, gas tank farm. So like we could investigate petroleum and non-petroleum. It doesn't matter. And um, so when we came up with the cleanup plan, uh, they were able to get funding from the um, And they, they moved their old uh, railroad depot and then they, they added on um, you know like some basic overhead shelters but left it open air so it'd be like a uh, three quarters of the year farmers market and like now they said that the um, the weddings and stuff but uh, that was a really good use of of the space and it's something they wanted anyway so um, they just had to do a little bit of cleanup make sure there was you know, some buffer Zones between some of the petroleum contaminated soil and yeast that can stay there and will eventually uh, clean itself up. Um, the city of Mankato has done some cool things. So they have the new Children's Museum of Minnesota, of Southern Minnesota, I believe it's called. So it's not just the Mankato Children's Museum, it's really for the whole southern part of the state. And it's, a, it's an, old, um, an old dump first, a big dump. Um, and then and then it was used as a bus depot, and then it was used as a city uh, garage, um, and so lots of things happened there. But they wanted to take that old bus depot building and make it into a children's museum, and we did a bunch of investigation and found a bunch of waste, and some of the deeper buried waste had asbestos materials. The shower waste did not. Uh, they did have some um, methane coming off the dump. They had some gases, off gases from the dump. But it came up with a good plan to put in a, a venting system underneath the building. It's not a big deal. They repaved the, the parking lot, um, and then they eventually opened. So they even have a little area where they're like growing corn and different crops, and so they can see what. You use all the farm equipment inside the museum for the outside exhibit, and it's all safe and it's beautiful. So that's the nice I have one question from the webinar. Um, is there any work being done on Riley Tar toward redevelopment? Yeah, actually, a large portions of the Riley Tar site in St. Louis Park are already redeveloped. Um, there are some that are like wetland, parkland that are going to stay that way and not necessarily now have a building on them because uh, you can develop into parkland. So you don't always have to do uh, buildings. And then um, you'll still hear about Riley Tar because there is a portion of it that's the groundwater contamination and that is a still ongoing cleanup effort. So yes, there's still work. reference to the previous question about an interesting and successful brownfield project, Minnesota Brownfield established a use case that was specifically for the purpose of having examples out there of what can really be done. Yeah. And if you go to their website, they have terrific case studies for a number of them. So, yep, you can see really good examples of things being turned around. We have a couple of those on our website. Um, but we haven't really updated in a long time. That's the fourth link is success stories from the Brownfield program, but um, we're not so great about updating. So you'll see some of them on there. The Hutchinson one's on there. Yeah. 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 Ye
all the twins ballpark is on there and stuff like that. There's lots more. I just want to go back to what Charlie was talking about, the Minnesota Brownfield Three Stake Awards. We're always looking for greater Minnesota and not just Minneapolis and St. Paul projects. So if you have a Brownfield redevelopment project that really is a highlight of your community, now we recommend that you definitely submit a nomination. It's a pretty quick process. The nominations usually open in September. And so if you sign up for our newsletter, you'll get an alert for that and definitely check out past year's finalists and winners because it's a, always a big variety of projects that have really highlighted um, yeah. brownfield redevelopment in communities. What specific categories for smaller communities? So you're not going up against the, the site in Minneapolis that created like, you know, 500 jobs, right? You know, there's different categories. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Lots of good examples up there. Everyone has a dump, everyone has a gas station, everyone has a dry cleaner, everyone has a railroad property. Uh, it's just normal, fine, deal with it. schedule 
which I know in Dakota County has some EPA money. Various cities like Duluth got EPA assessment money. There's South St. Paul has gotten some money from EPA to do assessments and perhaps even cleanups. So just check, if you're not a city person, check with your city, or if you are a city person, check with your county because there may be other resources available that I'm not even discussing today. And there's some EPA cleanup funds too. Yes, directly through EPA. Maybe that will continue. I know, right? <laughs> Get them all you can. <laughs> all right. So these are the programs that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to primarily focus on our contamination cleanup and investigation grant program. I'm going to talk a little bit about our cleanup revolving loan program. Um, and then if there's time, I can talk a little bit about our redevelopment grant program and demolition loan program. Those two programs, ones on the bottom, are uh, related to brownfields in that they're sort of site prep programs, but those two programs don't deal with contamination directly. So the purpose of our programs are to take away extra costs to developing on previously used sites. So um, demolition, uh, cleanup, some of those costs that if you were developing on a cornfield, you wouldn't necessarily. To apply for our funding, you have to be a public entity. That's how we roll. So cities, counties, HRAs, EDAs, or port authorities. So those public entities don't have to own the site, but you have to work through them to get your grant. Now some cities, because part of our grant process, you have to have a resolution of support from the city that says, I'm going to be um, the grantee in this case, we have our match committed, our city's on board with this plan. So sometimes, and I'll talk about our grant deadlines, but sometimes the city's deadlines are way ahead of when our deadlines are. So you should contact your cities early um, because you, you may have their process might just take a little longer. So eligible sites for our program include, like I said, private and publicly owned sites. You have to have known or suspected contamination. Suspected contamination, of course, applies only to the investigation grant. If you're coming in for a cleanup grant, um, we're assuming you have contamination. We're D, like I said, so we uh, like projects that create jobs, increase taxes, or have other economic benefits. But as I said before, you need a resolution from your local unit of government or whoever is that grantee. If it is a county, we do also ask that you get a resolution from the city just so the city knows what's going on. Um, and then for cleanup grants, you need that cleanup plan approved by the MPCA. That's kind of your ticket in the door is having an approved response action plan. So the MPCA, I talked about deadlines with the city. The MPCA also has their own deadline because oftentimes we have our grant applications due May 1st and November 1st. And on April 30th, people might go to the MPCA and say, I need my rent approved, I'm applying for deed funding tomorrow. But yeah, they, that's, a, that's a problem. So they've requested that if you know that you're gonna be applying for funds in a future grant round, to submit your response action plans to them at least you know, 30 to 45 days in advance so they have time to look them over. Because it might not be something that they're specifically working on. So the kinds of costs that we can pay for, and these are pretty similar with Met Council and Hennepin County, is we do investigation costs. So we actually have two different grants. One is just for investigation. So if you have a site, you think it might be contaminated, but you're maybe a small town and you're like, we don't have money to drill a hole, so what do we do? Um, you can apply for investigation funding. We can pay for those phase one, phase two costs, and to develop your cleanup. Now let's say you've already done those costs, you've already done those activities, and you have your response action plan, you know the cost, and you want to come in and pay for cleanup. In that case, if you are successful <coughs> in getting a cleanup grant, as part of that cleanup grant, we can go back and reimburse you for those costs that you spent on the investigation phase. So our 
statute says we can also pay for acquisition under this. That's because way back when our statute was written, um, cities were having to purchase these properties for the reasons that were mentioned earlier. And so acquisition was an eligible expense. Now you heard me say our programs are to take away extra costs to developing previously used sites. Well, in our opinion, acquisition is not an extra cost. Everybody's got to buy a site. It doesn't matter if you're buying the cornfield or the old grain elevator, you have to buy it. So what we've said is if the public entity has to purchase the site to make this kind of thing happen and the cleanup happen, we can look at your acquisition costs, but that's only as part of your match. We'll, we won't pay out on that. We just don't have enough money. Uh, you know, we want to pay for kind of these hard cleanup costs and uh, not spend valuable cleanup money on acquisition. Environmental consulting fees, of course, are eligible. Um, demolition. Demolition is tricky. Under our cleanup program, we can pay for demolition of a building if you have proven that there's contamination under the building and you need to take the building down to get to that contamination underneath the building. And asbestos abatement and things like that would be included in those demolitions. What we don't pay for is your grant administration. We don't pay for any of your application costs. Um, development costs. Again, we can pay for asbestos abatement in a building if your building has to come down because there's contamination underneath it. But if you're doing, say, a rehab and you have asbestos abatement, under this particular program, we can't pay for that. And that council can. Tennyson County can if it's a residential um, property, like an individual home. Um, and we, our EPA money can and the redevelopment money or the redevelopment grant that. I can talk about later. We don't pay for contingencies um, and we don't pay for landscaping. So once your site's all done and clean and you need to lay the side, plant the trees, you're on your own. So our grants, um, again, I said we have a match. Our grants can pay up to 75% of your cleanup costs. Um, Met Council and Hennepin County do not have matching requirements. But oftentimes, they are part of that 25% match to our grant. Um, our statute says 12% of that 25% has to come from an unrestricted source available to the city. Oftentimes, it's the developer that's paying it. Um, our investigation grant, because they're smaller grants, they have a cap at $50,000. Usually, that's enough to get to where you need to be. Our cleanup grants have no max. It just kind of depends on how much money we have that grant round. We typically have about $4 million per grant round, which goes. Um, yeah, but request what you need. Um, like I said, we don't do contingencies, but if you have a million dollar cleanup request, it's not unusual for us to fund. Typically, I would say, our grants are maybe around that half a million dollar mark, give or take. We do some smaller cleanup grants, some larger ones. Again, it just kind of depends on how much money we have uh, during that grant round. Our applications are competitive. And one of the slides that was taken out was, what do we rank our projects on? So um, we, like I keep mentioning, we rank our projects on what that end use is going to be primarily. So we're looking at, um, you know, how many jobs is this end product going to give us? And what are the taxes? Um, you're, you compete against everybody else that's in that grant round. So oftentimes I'll get a question like, well, I have a project that's going to create six jobs. So is that good? Is that, will that get funded? Is that enough? Like, well, I don't know who else is coming in that grant round. If you're competing against a bunch of big industrial buildings that are, you know, creating hundreds of jobs, eh, it might not rank as high. If you're competing against housing projects, which is what we're seeing now, I mean, all of our projects are all some kind of housing or multi-use projects that are going to have, you know, a caretaker and a groundskeeper and a couple jobs. You're competing against those same projects that you're that you have. So. Um, I always say we've never funded an application that we haven't received. So um, if 
you think you're, I mean, give us a call. If you're really questioning if it's worth your while to send in an application, if you really think you're not competitive, call us. We'll, we can kind of guide you along to say, yeah, no, this program's not for you. Or say, eh, throw your hat in the ring. You never know what's going to happen. You never know. So, is there any way, you know, is it, is, does it go on sort of the whole <coughs> or like is it something for your Minnesota? And relative to their population, we get some for a job, but some major jobs here in the metro area. Is there ways to balance that out? Yes and no. So we kind of know that when we're reviewing it, but that actual, some of our ranking criteria is based on ratios and kind of quantitative numbers, and some are more subjective. Um, how we rank our jobs and our taxes is it's based on the amount of money you're requesting. So for every deep dollar we would give out, how many jobs will we get back? So we run that ratio, and typically those sites in smaller towns, um, they're not as expensive. So it kind of works out. Okay. Okay, so um, our statute said that our funds should be spread throughout the state, which is a good idea. So um, right now our statutory ratio is um, we have to, if we get sufficient applications in, our goal is to fund at least 30, take 35% of our funding and get it out to greater Minnesota. 65 is metro. If we get sufficient applications in, that's easy to do. We don't always get enough applications in from Greater Minnesota to do that. In those cases, we have the flexibility to use the money wherever. Sometimes we fund more than 35% of our um, funds out to Greater Minnesota, so it just kind of depends on what we get in. Uh, so some other things besides jobs and taxes we rank on, and this is a really important one, is readiness. So we have grant rounds every six months, so they're always rolling around. Um, for this program, we have base funding, so we always have funding. You never have to worry about if there's going to be another grant round or not. So we want everybody to apply when they're ready, because we want to know that once we give you the funds, you're going to hit the ground running, clean up your site, and put your development. So how fast can we get our bang for our buck is kind of what we what we look at. So readiness is a huge uh, ranking criteria for us. So you might have a project that has fewer jobs, maybe a little bit fewer economic development benefits, but we know when you have a developer, they got their financing and they're ready to go, that might rank better than a site that's this big grandiose site that you know someday might happen. So again, our applications, Met Council applications, Hennepin County and Ramsey County applications are all due May 1st to November 1st. Ours are due at 4. I don't know if they have certain times that they're set to be in. We're not going to kick you out if you send it at 4 to 1. But um, our stuff is on our website. And um, like I said, apply when you're ready. We are having, I'm going to put in a little shameless plug for a future workshop that we're having. If you're a power user, sorry, Sam, um, we are having kind of a sort of tips and tricks workshop coming up because we have a lot of um, people who apply frequently and um, we just want to give a little tutorial on how to fill out an application and how to be really successful in your applications because sometimes the things that are important to you as project managers and as people who are really close to the project aren't necessarily the things that we're looking at when we're reviewing applications, so we're just going to have a tips and tricks session on that. So stay tuned for that. The notice should be coming out today. All right, next is cleanup revolving loan program, so seed head money that's capitalized through EPA, like everyone else's money, that we can give out uh, loans. So there's a couple things about that. We have trouble getting our loan money. Why? Because we have free grant money. So who wants loan money when you can get grant money? Because 
grant money is always better. Well, I'll tell you who. Um, our cleanup, our loan money is different in that we can loan to folks other than public entities. So we also can loan to private entities and nonprofits. So that's one difference. Another is our loan program is not necessarily tied to uh, economic self. So we can do loans for parks. Um, we've done loans for bridge financing. So if you have a dry cleaner site that you're expecting reimbursement through the dry cleaner fund, but that, as we know, takes lots of time sometimes, depending on how, many, how much money comes into the program and how fast it goes out. So we have done bridge um, financing with um, Dry Cleaner Fund. I am working with EPA right now to see how to use our EPA funding for strictly vapor intrusion um, projects. So pro properties that may not have like soil and groundwater contamination, which is primarily what we look at, but might have vapor issues either from an off-site property or um, that doesn't have an economic development component. Maybe it's a business that's operating on the site that's realized they had a vapor issue and needs to clean it up. And it wouldn't be eligible for our grant program because there's no like new development and new thing happening. So with that program, you have to have completed your all appropriate inquiries, which basically means the phase one report. Um, you have to own the property or have an ownership interest in the property. You have to have the NCPA approved reps that you need for our cleanup program. You can't be a responsible party, and most importantly to us, you have to have an ability to repay the loan back. Um, costs already incurred are not eligible. It, it, there's a process to this. It, it takes a little bit of time, but um, something you might want to talk to us about if you're interested in a loan or you really feel like um, your project doesn't fit quite well with our regular grant. Maybe you don't have that economic development component. Another way that we use the loan is in sites like Grizzly High Rock Plant. If you have a site that has such extensive cleanup, like I just said, we have $4 million per grant round, we're not going to give $4 million to one site. So we have to spread that money out. So if you do have a site that's very expensive, oftentimes what will happen is we'll give a loan out to kind of along with the package with our grant money to, to make the project work. Um, one thing I want to mention about our loan money, and this is kind of why I'm talking about it now, and I was in a meeting about this yesterday, and I don't know, I'm such a you know shrewd negotiator, because what I really said to folks is, our loan money is going to expire in September, so I want to give loan money out probably more than anybody wants to have it. So um, yeah, I don't I don't know if it'll get extended. We'll request an extension, but that's when we're trying to think of creative ways to use this loan money and to use it this year. So if you have any ideas or if you have any thoughts on, you know, I have this site that doesn't really fit or I have applied four times to your site, your grant program, you know, whatever, um, we really want to get this money out the door. EPA. And so far, you know, they've been very forgiving. Um, yeah, but again, it's hard. Other states can fly through their uh, loan money pretty quickly, but since we have such a robust grant um, state, it's harder for us to get rid of our loan money because there's so many sources of free money around. So, but that's my shameless plug for that. Um, I think I have some time, so I'm going to go the time. I think that's my Oh, okay. Here we are. So I'm going to talk a little bit. Wait, before I go on, because there's, I'm switching gears here, but does anybody have some questions on the contamination cleanup or investigation grant program? I know if you're like Charlie, that, or, you know, most of you are new, so it's probably a little bit overwhelming, but it's probably a little underwhelming for those of you who have used our program before. How it works is something that people may not quite realize. Usually this is initiated by a developer who wants to undertake a development on a test property, and they come to the city. 
say, well, we want to go through this state program, but you need to help us do it. And so that, that you need to be receptive to that, to being the only person in that, in that the transaction that occurred between the state transfer and the council, whatever, and the final use in the cleanup and certification. So that's a plan for the role. I have a comment and one question from the webinar. The comment is that Hennepin County is not going to have a spring 2017 ERS grant round, but there will be a fall 2017 grant round. Um, and then the question is, do you have any good examples of green job cleanup and redevelopment? I do not have any good examples that are coming to mind. Um, yeah, I I don't know. And there's lots of different definitions of what's considered a green job. So um, yeah, I, nothing is coming coming to mind right now. Um, the the Fridley well being like. <laughs> White Crags Manufacturer coming in. Um, it's one of the new businesses in that from the We would kind of think of fabulous packages like the industry. So mm -hmm. I would like to know. I think the St. Paul Port Authority might have received funds for their Beacon Plus site, <laughs> um, which is in St. Paul. Um, and they have now Moventas there, which is a turbine company that makes turbines for uh, wind development. Great. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to move on to a couple other programs that I just want to mention. And that's the redevelopment grant program and demolition loan program. So these are kind of sister programs to our standard investigation and cleanup brownfield program. So these also are sort of considered brownfield programs, although this is not related to contamination. I always think they're both kind of site prep programs, and I always think our contamination cleanup program is the site prep that's sort of underground, and the redevelopment program is the site prep that's above ground. So this program pays for things like demolition of buildings. You don't have to have contamination underneath it. Um, we do some infrastructure improvements. Um, if you have geotechnical soils, maybe your soil is not contaminated, but it's just not suitable for build, this program can help stabilize that soil so that you can build on that site. Um, the same kind of deal is to take away extra costs to develop in that site. Same um, applicants, local units of government, still need a resolution. Um, we still have a competitive grant program that we still look at things like what that end development can produce in terms of jobs and taxes. Um, sorry, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Again, these are the things we pay for under this program. We can pay for and specify either if you're doing a demolition project or if you're doing a rehab project. Um, our EPA loan money also does a specify maintenance, but they're interested in. Um, we pay for ponding. If our statute says or other environmental infrastructure. I don't know what other environmental infrastructure is besides ponding, but if you know what it is, you just put that right in your budget and we'll take a look at that. Um, we can do infrastructure improvements. What we don't want to see with this program is we're not here to pay for your development costs. Um, sometimes we'll see projects where uh, they've already done the demolition and they're doing a um, construction project and would like us to put in um, sidewalks and streets and lights and alleys and that's just not what we're about. If you have Infrastructure, say you have a site like the Maxon Steel, which is a huge um, you know, building that housed one industry, 
and they redevelop that into like five different parcels. Uh, light industrial. Well, obviously, your one water pipe that was going into that building is, you know, you need to move that stuff. So that's the kind of thing that we pay for, and we like to see that as sort of ancillary to the demo. Demo is really what we want. This program is 50 percent. Yes. Back to the previous um, slide. So um, environmental infrastructure. You'll consider paying for, but landscaping you will. Correct. You know, trees that are in tree boxes with engineered soil uh, act as uh, greater stormwater mitigation infrastructure. Is it eligible? No. Um, even in a case of like a rain garden, like we can pay for like gravel or whatever you kind of need underground, but the trees, we don't kind of. We kind of look at them as kind of a capital cost, and those trees um, and plantings, although they're kind of part of the rain garden, we, we don't pay for that, but we'll pay for more of the structural type of stuff. So maybe the maybe the box and stuff, the drainage, but not the actual plant material. So this is a 50% match program. The cleanup was 75, you know, 75 us, 25 you. This was 50-50. Um, also, our split between Seven County Metro and Greater Minnesota is 50-50. You remember, cleanup was 65-35. Again, applications are competitive. Applications for this program are due today by four. So. <laughs> um, these grants are typically due February and August, so every three months there's some grant round, either cleanup or redevelopment. Right now, um, we only have money for this current grant round of February, so whether or not we'll have an August grant round is up in the air. It just depends on what the legislature does. They want to give us more money. Um, if they do, we'll for sure have a round in August because we'll get that money by July 1st. It's not our first rodeo, so we can get that done pretty quickly. Um, so stay tuned. Just kind of keep watching to see whether or not that program is going to get funded. Give us a call if you have any questions on it. So a subset to the redevelopment grant program, and this has been a successful program for us, is a demolition loan program. So as I said throughout the presentation is we want projects that are going to produce jobs and taxes and there's some kind of economic development happening. Well, in around, I don't know, 2008 when business wasn't booming and development wasn't happening and we were getting lots of calls saying, well, we really could use this redevelopment grant program, but we don't have any developers knocking on our doors wanting to build their, you know, insert product here. Um, but we have these buildings and they're falling down and they're health and safety hazard and kids are breaking in there and smoking cigarettes and drinking wine coolers and it's, you know, the cops are called all the time. What can we do about these buildings? Hmm. So what we created is a demolition loan program. So we said, okay, we'll come in, we'll give you a loan to get the buildings down. In expectation that once the building's down and once the blight is gone, that you'll get a development on the site. Um, so for this program, the applicant must own the property and the structure. So the city has to own the building. Why is that? Because we went around the state and said, what do you think of this program when it was just a delivery and someone by? <coughs> and city said, no city in their right mind is going to take out a loan on a property that they don't. So we got to own. The structures have to be vacant at least a year, and that kind of says something. Nobody's biting at it. Um, it can't be listed on the uh, National Register of Historic Places because SHPO wouldn't be kind to us if we were tearing down um, historic buildings. Um, there has to be some kind of threat to public safety or human health. 
and that it's expected that the site will eventually be redeveloped. We can give up two million bucks, but that's based on what we have, long-term loan, two per, ooh, two percent interest. Um, interest and payment free for the first two years, so you can get the buildings down, market the site, and hopefully get somebody in there. Um, you can't tear the building down until after we give you a loan. <coughs> oh, okay, so that's my secret ringer here. So the beauty of this demolition loan is if you had a development at the time that you were applying for a loan, you would have just applied for redevelopment grants because as we said earlier, grants are better than loans. So under this case, let's say you tear your building down. You have this nice pristine piece of land now. A developer comes along and says, hey, I like that piece of property. I want to develop on. All right, ready? Stay tuned. Dun, 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 dun. So if you get a development, we can forgive up to 50% of your loan. So it would have been just like that 50% match redevelopment grant that you would have applied for had you had that bird in the hand at the time of application. So good news, bad news is um, the demolition loan funds are the exact same pot of money that the redevelopment funds come from. And um, I, this was within eight minutes. So you should remember that I said we're almost out of money. We're going to be out of money after applications come in today. So stay tuned if your city is thinking that demolition loan is for you. Just kind of watch that redevelopment grant program to see if you get funding for that program. So that's it for me. Are there any more questions? Yes. One from the webinar, this is a question about the grants. Um, do you know how much total grant money has been awarded in Minnesota since DEED, CBRA, and ERS started these cleanup programs? And do you know of other states that award these types that award these types of grants? So I can't speak to Met Council and Hennepin County. I think DEED's cleanup award amount, I want to say it's hundred and fifty million about since the inception, which was 1998. Um, we, we by far have the most robust state in terms of funding, in terms of grant funding. Wisconsin does a lot of, uh, they have a lot of grant money. Um, a lot of states use that EPA cleanup money or an assessment and revolving loan money, but I really don't know um, of any other states that have as much grant money for cleanup as we do here. Do you know what the economic impact of that is? So just compared to the maybe some tax dollars and private. You know, that's a slide that came out. <laughs> I have that on there. So I'm thinking if my memory is serving me and um, about 20,000 new and retained jobs for D, this is just my numbers. Um, we're in the billions for private leverage. Um, we're in the, I want to say, 163 million in tax base increase. And I want to say just under maybe 4,000 acres. Don't quote any of those numbers because I'm, you know, taking them off the top of my head, but I do re use those a lot. So. Yeah, so Minnesota Brownfields actually every year we do research where we compile all of the grant funding numbers from DEED, Met Council, Hennepin County, and um, Ramsey County. And so we look at what the tax base increase was since the beginning of the program, um, what the jobs were. And I think DEED's estimate is $44 return on investment for every dollar invested in their program. So that's huge. And that's on Minnesota Brownfields website under the Land Recycling 101 tab under Benefits of Brownfield Redevelopment. And we just looked at the Redevelopment Grant Program also to see what the benefits of that program have been. So if you're looking for those specific numbers, you can find them <coughs> on our website. Can you talk a little bit more about how your organization impacts? Sure. So we do a lot of promotion of these programs, and we do a lot of um, education for their programs and statewide other programs like MCCAs um, just around the state and try to get the word out. We do a lot of that research to especially talk to um, policymakers and legislators just to make sure that they're aware that these programs exist and that they have a lot of benefits. 
about to say because a lot of times that message is lost. Brown fields aren't always the sexiest thing. You know, in the governor's budget, it can tend, kind of tends to get lost under bigger, more pressing issues. Um, because brown fields are a prolonged problem, it's kind of hard to keep them on the forefront. So we, we do our best to make sure that people are paying attention to that issue. Um, so, Janet, you basically have run out of time. Um, Natalie, Martha has a comment for you that um, can you let people know that if they'd like a fact sheet on the redevelopment grant program, Minnesota Brownfields can. Hi, everyone. My name is Janet. Um, Presentation on our 100 acre redevelopment project that has a bunch of different environmental challenges in sight. Um, before I get started, a lot of the discussion was about a site, a building, um, some funding opportunities that might be available to help assist in realizing this project. Our project was 100 acres with development blocks A through J. The city owned all 100 acres, and we cleaned it up under two master um, redevelopment plans that the MPCA reviewed and approved, and then each development partner that came in also underwent a similar process. So um, it's a little complicated in that respect, and I apologize. I'm fighting a cold, so I may need to cough. I apologize in advance for that. So if you don't know where New Brighton is, we're a first tier. Um, suburb of the city of St. Paul. Our population is about 22,000 square feet. We're about 7, 000, uh, seven square miles in size. Our project, it used to be known as the Northwest Quadrant, kind of got a negative connotation. We renamed it to New Brighton Exchange, but it got that name because it's located at the northwest corner of the interstates of 694 and 35W. That just happens to be um, the second busiest intersection in the metropolitan area. As I mentioned, our site is 100 acres in size, and I'll show you some maps in a minute. And Old Highway 8 splits that site essentially in half. Um, in terms of location, it's adjacent to Long Lake Regional Park. That's the largest regional park in Ramsey County, and it's proven to be a pretty good amenity. Um, our community center is also nearby, along with some other industrial uses. <coughs> So all the uses that we talked about here, our site had it. Um, going way back, it was an original stockyard site. We had a propane distribution user, a trucking terminal, two rendering plants, a dump, um, asphalt recycling, complicating in terms of redevelop, uh, relocating businesses. We had a United States Post Office. We also had a railroad spur, gas stations. There's an old Superfund oil refinery and various other commercial industrial uses with minor asbestos and um, demolition challenges. Here are some pictures. Um, this one here is from 2000. Uh, this down here shows you the volume of properties that were involved and all the various buildings that um, we had to deal with. So 100 acres, tons of different property buildings that had to be demoed. Um, and then the top picture was really nice. We did have the smokestack. Um, and then the dump is located right here. The city used it for a driving range for many years before we tackled this project. Before I get into all the details of our cleanup plan, this is a big project, and this isn't something the city undertook lightly. They've been studying this project since you know, the late, early 80s, even the 1970s. The city has been in active redevelopment mode since the 1970s. We didn't just say, hey, let's get involved in brownfield redevelopment, tackle this 100-acre project. We have been tackling sites, or New Brighton has been tackling sites since the 1970s, taking smaller piecemeal sites along the old Highway 8 corridor, working ourselves up to this project. And there were a variety of reasons for doing that. Obviously, we learned along the way what we needed to do but also financial. I mean, the city started redevelopment in the 1970s. If any of you are aware of um, TIF rules prior to 1990, you could capture all of your access TIF and use it for other redevelopment. That helped us build a development war chest that we needed to do this project and have a slide about 1% of the year. So 
but numerous studies involving this site. Going on to some environmental statistics, um, we demolished 20 plus buildings and cleared sites. We did lots of due diligence investigation, phase one, phase two on all those properties. Um, we did well ceiling, asbestos abatement. Um, I'm going to talk east side, west side because 50 acres on each side and they each had their unique environmental challenges. On the west side, that's directly abutting Long Lake Regional Park and is generally our housing side of the project, although there is some office buildings there now. Um, two state Superfund sites, Trio Solvents is a very small like chemical recycling business. Imagine like a little detached garage that people used to bring out chemicals to. And then the Northwest Refinery, that was a big site with a responsible party that was brought back in during the recession to do a, a massive cleanup project. Um, we had two former gas stations with some petroleum impacts, so we had to enter the VIC program and the petroleum program. Um, debris remover and a former rail, a former rail spur, we actually had to relocate a rail spur, which was a challenge in and of itself. And, you know, we found anything and everything within that corridor once we acquired it. And if environmental challenges weren't enough, we had a lot of geotechnical corrections that we had to do. So I would advocate as you start doing your due diligence and completing those phase one and phase two, the same probe that looks for environmental issue isn't the probe that looks for geotechnical issues. And to try and think about all the various problems you might incur, just look at your soils for geotechnical corrections in addition to the straight contaminants. On the east side, the biggest issue we dealt with was um, an old dump called the Old Miller Dump. This is a 1960 era, era dump. There's 100 million cubic yards of dump material. Most of it isn't hazardous in the sense that it's asbestos or chemicals, but it's construction waste and garbage. And it produces a lot of things. <coughs> and then, um, we also had to rebuild a quarter mile section of Old Highway 8. That's the road that split the site in half. There was also environmental challenges below the road. And then um, to deal with stormwater, when you have all these environmental issues, generally you're not allowed to infiltrate. So we had to create um, eight different regional use stormwater facilities to help um, all of our development partners as they developed blocks A through J to direct their stormwater. So this um, is a blown up picture that I had on a previous slide. Um, this yellow line, and I have another picture here in a minute that shows you everything that was impacted environmentally. But Northwest Refinery and Trio Solvents, those are the two state Superfund sites that have since been delisted. Um, Old Miller Dump, and then you've probably heard of PCAP, which is 4,000 feet to the northeast in the city of Arden Hills. And this site, this picture is the one that I like, and I hope the colors come through. So of the 100 acres, about 50% of it was <coughs> previously impacted from an environmental standpoint. And that's all these peach areas. Um, this is the actual dump. The largest was the dump. This yellow area here, this line represents the previous boundary of the old Miller dump. It was not financially possible to dig all the dump out and turn it to a landfill. landfill. There was just too much of it. So what we did is we developed, we dug out everything beyond that or within that yellow line to create clean developable blocks around the dump. Um, so we couldn't get rid of it completely. We wanted to figure out a way to develop around it. And you know that becomes very important to remember. Uh, I think there was multiple references to soil gas being an emerging concern, and that's what we're dealing with on the east side. Most of these um, developable blocks have been cleaned from the soil standpoint, but we're dealing with landfill gas migration and making sure that it doesn't get into those buildings. On the east side, most of that was um, petroleum contamination, some leftover soil contamination from trio solvents, um, and we dug the boundary for Northwest Refinery is about right here. So this is the responsible party was brought in and dealt with this. This stuff we dug out and um, took to a landfill, and then we had to bring clean soil back in. And then we had we actually dug out a lot more than that, just because, as I mentioned before, geotechnically the soils weren't suitable for these buildings. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So the biggest challenge we had was the dump closure. As I mentioned, it was too cost prohibitive to dig it all out, so we had to develop blocks around it. And what we did was some of it we trucked to the landfill, some we consolidated on what we call Block B. Um, we created a landfill gas collection system. You can kind of see it as a little figure eight that is within the dump boundary that passively collects methane and vents it to the atmosphere. We installed a cap. You can see some of this black piece here. That's the thick plastic liner that was put over the stuff that we left in place. And we have to monitor it. Right now we're monitoring it quarterly. So, you know, all the little white candy cane pipes you see sticking out of the ground, we have people that are going there quarterly to monitor the methane levels. Um, we have a response action plan that the MCCA approved, and there are lots of different guidelines in there about monitoring and what the different levels of methane are and when we need to notify other people of different things. But the monitoring has proven to be um, an ongoing challenge, and you have to have good relationships with your development partners for this to be successful. <coughs> then this is a nice pretty picture we got. Um, after we finished the dump cleanup and we got grass to grow, um, we had two projects at this point, and I'll show you those in a minute. Um, we weren't completely done over here on the west side, but I think this picture was like maybe 2011. Um, and I'll just take this opportunity quickly to say we received lots of deep funding, and I have a slide on here in a minute to do the dump cleanup, and we had a development partner in place, and then the recession hit, and they took a hike. We um, took that opportunity to uh, clean up the dump during recession when we were able to capitalize on very competitive construction pricing. And so, you know, a big project like this takes a lot of time and effort, and even something super negative like the deep recession that we had we were able to take advantage of that opportunity and get some positives out of it with our project. <coughs> our project would not be possible without intergovernmental coordination. And I have a financial slide in a minute, but I think that financial slide shows that we've received just under $10 million in grant money to do all the various cleanups that we had to do. We still spend a lot more money. The city's got $80 million invested in this project. And those um, grants are contamination cleanup grants through the and Met Council that actually involve digging dirt out and trucking it to the landfill. But we also received lots of money from the EPA early on, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency in Ramsey County, to do some <coughs> um, <coughs> study and cleanup to figure out what we had. But, um, you can see all the different agencies that were involved and the funding that we received. And I also want to note that you know grant money isn't free. You have to report every year on your project to these agencies and don't underestimate the time it takes to do that. But obviously we understand that we need to give them the data that they need to show the legislature how much money they're actually leveraging by doing these grants. So here's a quick snapshot of the financials, and I apologize, I've given some version of this presentation to a couple of different groups. So if you've seen it and you're like, well, that number wasn't quite the same last time I see this presentation, it's because we're constantly updating our financial numbers um, to reflect, you know, current market values and what our interfund loan amounts are. And there's a lot of different moving targets that could make these numbers change slightly, but. We had about $28 million in acquisition costs and business relocation costs. So we had to move that recycling asphalt plant. We had to move that propane distribution plant. Um, we got $9.8 million in grant funds. We've created two TIP districts, one on each side of the road, and then there's a hazardous substance sub-district within each of those TIP districts, and that allows us to capture tax increment to pay ourselves back. Um, <coughs> we we now got $38 million in geo bonds, and we've refinanced those a couple of times to save some money, um, which we're making payments on those bonds through the tax increment that's generated. We also have a pretty healthy redevelopment fund, and we've been lucky enough to have $13 million to loan ourselves to help float this project while tax increment gets generated. We found ourselves in a situation where we acquired property, we cleaned it up, and then all of a sudden we're creating tax increment. That's not the intent of tax increment. 
and tons of tax increment as you start generating it once you've redeveloped the site. Well, these properties were so blighted, just taking down the buildings made the taxes go up because the land became worth more. So that gets to these two points down here. Um, we went to the legislature and we said, look, at, we only get to collect tax increments for 25 years and the clock's already started and a recession hit and we don't have any development. And so we received special legislation to do a couple of things. We were able to extend the duration of our two districts, that's referencing 31 and 32, by four years. So we can collect tax increment on both of those districts for four additional years. And then we were able to get special legislation where they allowed us to pool tax increment from some other districts that were established post-1990 where you can't technically pool tax increment, but they allowed us to pool to help support this project just in light of all of the various challenges that we were facing. And what do you get? <coughs> I, the picture we had wasn't oriented the same way, so I apologize. The other pictures I had, um, Old Highway 8 was going north-south. In this instance, north is to the right. But um, we've got on the east side of the road, we've got two um, office industrial buildings, um, CSI and CSI. Yes, you have to have an acronym for your company name in order to be in the grant exchange. No, <laughs> but, um, between these two buildings, there's about 250 jobs, um, and you know the market values of these projects are well above 10 million. On the other side of the road, we've got um, API Group, another acronym. Uh, they actually just built their second building. Um, two of them right here. We have a market rate apartment building, 124 units, and um, we also right now our Pulte Homes is developing 125 housing units, 89 single family homes and 36 towns. They're almost done. Now yeah, we have two blocks left to develop. <laughs> so we, uh, just so you know, we technically are the project manager. We acquire all the property. Um, we worked with our consultants to help clean it up. And there's another pitch for your consultants. We could not do this without them. Um, I really would advocate for you to develop a really special relationship with your consultants because they know this stuff way better than I do. I, you know, my, my background is planning. So um, we also brought in Ryan and Colliers. They are our non-exclusive um, master developer. They actually have developed the CSI building, which is here. And then Colliers is helping us market the site. <coughs> and here's some photos. So this is the um, this building here is on the east side. These two were the first ones in. Actually, this was the first one in. And then these are the two API buildings um, on the west side of the road. And here's some photos of the housing. The three there are Pulte Homes, and this is the market rate apartment building that I mentioned. And that's all I have. It's a huge project, and um, I didn't quite know what to focus on, so I did a broad brush over you, both of you, but I'll take these questions. Did you have any requirements for the development that occurred on the street? Like, yeah, um, so part of the overall planning process was we created our own special zoning district for this 100 acres. Um, very creatively called the Brighton right Exchange Zoning District. And we actually planned what we wanted on each of these blocks. Having said that, I want another message to be you have to be flexible and you have to be able to adapt and change to market conditions because, you know, when we first started this project, we had a vision of 700 housing units and then the recession hit and that changed everything. And so you have to um, be able to evolve with the market, but still try and meet some of your overall larger goals about building a pedestrian-friendly environment. That was something we had. Enhanced streetscapes with lots of sidewalk connections. Um, we also had lots of grand visions for doing um, green, sustainable landscaping, but it didn't work out because our site is contaminated and you can't infiltrate when there's contamination. So, you know, some of those things we wish we would have gotten and we didn't get, 
but we also have encouraged our development partners to um, build their buildings in a sustainable manner. The two API buildings I mentioned, those are both LEED certified at a platinum status. So we definitely advocate and support our development partners' efforts to do those kinds of things. Can you go back to the picture of the, where the dump was? Yep. Maybe the one with the building on it now. Sorry. Um, so will that dump just one? remain as an area that will be <coughs> developed? I know you're monitoring it. <laughs> so like, how long does that process go for? As long as it's producing methane and based on the volume of material and methane, it's going to be a long time. So you have to plan that into your financial model. Um, we would love to develop one. <laughs> And one pitch that I would have for the future of brownfield development, we have to start looking at engineering methods to support and have development on redeveloped sites. Because digging out the dirt and trucking it to a landfill is not always going to be your only solution. And even when you do that, you're still dealing with subsurface migration of residual vapors that you have to plan for. We think, and, and we'll work with our consultants and we'll collaborate with the MPCA and the science is constantly changing and policies the MPCA is constantly, the policies they have are constantly changing, but we think we could develop Block B, which is dump underneath. You're going to have to pile through the garbage. We're probably not going to be able to have an uh, inhabitable floor as the first floor to be able to provide um, adequate separation and venting. But we think that there are engineering solutions to develop Block B, and we hope that technically the agency gets to the point where we'll support that. And some of it has gone on, but um, it's just going to take a take time. You know, that's going to be the last block to get developed if it ever gets developed, because we're still dealing with some of the surrounding clean blocks, clean in the sense that there's still residual paper concerns, but. Yeah, the dump is going to stay there. We're going to monitor it until we need to, which is probably going to be a pretty long time, and we would love to develop on top of it in the future. You mentioned consultants and technical challenges. I think it's valuable for people to realize that environmental science, geotechnical and structural engineering, and so many environments, entirely different disciplines with entirely different education and experience that come in. So you can't expect that one person would Hopefully you can get as much as you can out of a term, but it doesn't always work that way. And wherever you can lump, like you mentioned, you can do environmental and geotechnical together, that's nice, it's helpful, it's money. Um, but sometimes that's also just not the end of it. So you do need a lot of different people. You need to make sure that, that when they say, you need a structural engineer or you need a civil engineer. Trust them. Yeah, you know, I've done a version of this presentation to a couple of different groups, and some of them ask for things like lessons learned or what were your enlightening moments. And one thing I like to say is <clears throat> this project is very long in the making. I'm the third staff person that's acted as the project manager. And it is really important that you keep good files. You keep good relationships with your consultants. Our environmental consultant has the longest history of anybody involved in this project because staff turnover changes at the city. Councils change. Um, you know, political influences have a big impact on what's going to happen. So in a project like this, you really need to build a good team. And one of the most important elements of that team is your environmental consultant. If you know if you don't have civil engineering building your you know your civil engineering consultant, if you need a master developer like we have Ryan companies, they're the ones that know what does it cost to take, what does it cost to build a three story building versus a four or five story building, especially if you have to put pilings under the building. You're not going to pile a two story building. So all of those things working together, meeting regularly and being on the same page towards one unified goal, because the other part of that is 
the development community pays attention to your reputation. And if you have a reputation at the local level, that is going to take you six months to get a development project proposed because you don't have all the right partners that are on the same page working towards the same end goal. It's going to be unique, you know, much more challenging to be able to get success on the project. So your team is really, really important. And like I said, I'm the third project manager on this project. I've been in the city 11 years, and I have a lot of institutional knowledge, but I got a lot of that from previous employees and previous consultants that we've worked with being involved on a daily basis. Um, good question. So the city entered the VIC program and the petroleum program, and all of our development partners also entered those same programs. Um, part of our approved RAP required us not only to monitor the dump, but to monitor landfill gas migration beyond the dump. So yes, we monitor the little candy canes that come out of the ground that are within the dump, but we have a whole network of monitoring points beyond the dump. And we have this very complicated landfill gas contingency action plan with this flow chart of if the monitoring point reaches this, we have to we have to notify all of our development partners. So the agreements that we have with our development partners outline all of those specifics. We have monitoring points on property now where we're monitoring for landfill gas migration, but we're monitoring it on property that we've since sold to development partners. So they have to provide us access to their property to monitor to monitor those points on a regular basis. And you know, I'll be honest, there are some situations down here where one of our monitoring points is hitting above our action level for methane. The building has a landfill has a, a, a soil gas system, but when our vents are testing above our action level, which is like 10% of the explosive limit. It's Fire. But um, we notify our development partner and then they go and test the passive system that they have in their building to confirm that nothing is getting in their building and everything is safe. So it's really important, important that you have good agreements in place and you maintain really good working relationships with these development partners into the future because you have to work together. And that's the biggest thing the MPCA has advocated for transparency, good working relationships. They want to know that you know the city isn't walking away the second we sell the property to somebody else. And there are the restrictions that are recorded against all the properties putting these people on notice. Do you have a question suggestion from the webinar? Um, why couldn't you put a ballasted solar field on top of the unused dump site? Um, that's definitely been something that's been talked about. I um, don't know specifically about solar. We obviously want to develop it because we want jobs and tax base. So that's our ultimate goal. And you know, you can make an argument for some of these green types of uses that have value. The other part is um, you talked about the volume of methane that was created, and can you take that methane and produce energy? There's just I mean, there's a lot of nothing, but there's not enough to do that um, on site. I think that probably answers the question, but if not. For the funding and the grants that you've received, can you reapply for, for grants multiple times? And this might be a question for you said. Um, does the grant correlate with a specific area? For a specific project, like if you do soil remediation one year and a redevelopment, I mean, can you stack on top of? I think we've received the Met Council grants, two of them on each side of the road. So, granted, one probably impacts 
impacted one section of property and one development request, whereas another wasn't exactly the same. But I think the answer is yes. Yes. And then what we would want is a, particularly a project this big with that, that high cost. Um, we'd like to see those projects somehow phased. And what works the best is phased by future development. So housing stuff might come in as one project, the industrial part might come in as another project, but it's better for us if it's sort of geographically split and also split by future use. in here after it looks like they're gathering. Kay, do you want to actually tell us what that's about? Sure. Um, we're, we're gathering uh, uh, city folks to talk about um, emerald ash borer response plan. So not about the, the insect issue, but as much about um, removal, possible injection, replacement of trees and how medium to, to smaller cities are, are paying for this. These are huge budget impacts. Um, the legislature and, and our Dayton's budget are not addressing. Uh, and also, you know, in comparison to the old Dutch Elm disease days and funding for that, um, it, it, the impacts are significant. And it's just uh, like a nightmare that, that's hanging over against the elephants in the room that no one's addressing. So since we've got a room, and an element I encourage everybody to stick around and join those folks that are obviously gathering in the lobby to talk about this. What can we do? Yeah, that's a 